Good morning. Uh, hello. <laughs> good morning. It's good to see you this morning. I hope you're alert and ready to go. Man, I've been praying for this day ever since I knew Brother Bill was going to be able to come. I told him that uh, when he contacted me and said he had an open date or cancellation, I said, well, I'm thinking to myself, it won't be canceled long. And so about five minutes later, I texted him back and said, book it. And so this is a God thing today, okay? Because he was scheduled to be somewhere else. God changed that for him to be here. So we believe that that's just God. And so I'm glad that you're here. It's a God thing for you to be here. God knew who was going to be here today, not only Brother Bill, but also for each one of us. And so, um, man, that's just exciting to me to know that God has done that kind of thing this morning for us to be together. And I, in just a moment, uh, Brother Bill is going to come and preach for us. And um, I just, uh, for those of you that do not know, it was Brother Bill Britt. He is our evangelist friend from Halton, Louisiana. Brother Bill preaches all across the United States and in many countries of the world. Since he's been with us, he's been back to Kenya and uh, was able to go there and to, to minister in, in the ministries that they have over there. And that's exciting uh, for him to have been able to do that, especially these days, to be able to get back over there. Uh, but you be praying for him. You be praying for his ministry, for his wife, Wendy, and for their children, their grandchildren. Uh, but you especially pray for him today uh, as he delivers the word of God to us today, that it will be a very, very special anointed time. Now, unless there's other cancellations sometime along the way, uh, he's, always, he's going to be back with us uh, in September of uh, next year. Um, and then he will also be with us in March of the following year. And so in, in Bible conference. And so uh, we're excited about all that. So Brother Bill, after we, we spend some time singing and praising the Lord, you come and uh, preach the word of God for us today. A while ago, I was holding open the door and people were walking in. You know, sometimes you, you get there where you're at the door, holding the door, and then the line just continues on, you know. And somebody said, thank you for being the doorkeeper. Okay. And so I just immediately thought of that verse of scripture. It's over in Psalm 84 and verse 10. It says, for a day in your courts is a better, is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory and no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you. Amen. My prayer is if you've never trusted in Christ, for your Savior, that you would do so today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you and praise you for this day. Thank you, Lord, that we get to come and celebrate what you have done in our lives. Father, I pray that we give glory and adoration to the name of Jesus Christ today. And then, Lord, I pray for the preached word today. I pray that you'd bless Brother Bill, that you would use him this morning and tonight. And God, that we would be receptive vessels and Lord, I pray for revival in our hearts. And for those of us that know Jesus, Lord, that there will be a revival. For those that are here today that maybe have never trusted in Christ to be their Lord and Savior, may they just see how great you are and how wonderful it is to be a servant of yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Father, Son, and the Spirit rise. As they set the world in motion, the morning of the first sunrise, a symphony of golden sunlight dances in the Father's eyes. He gazes at his masterpiece as all creation cries. Thank you, choir. Let's stand together. I'm pressing on the upward way. Let's sing together.
remain standing. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Brother Monty Huckabee, would you come up here and lead us in prayer, please, sir? Father, we come to you this morning thanking you for the opportunity we have to come to your house. Father, we thank you for the presence we feel already, the moving of your spirit, Father, in our hearts, the songs that we've sung to honor you and uplift you. We just pray that just move in a mighty way in our, our service this morning as Brother Bill comes. And Father, I just pour out, pray that you'd pour out your spirit upon Brother Bill and anoint the word as he speaks. And those words might not fall on deaf ears, but they fall on tender hearts that need to make decisions for Christ, Father. If there's someone here this morning that's never made a decision for Christ, I pray that you'd move in a special way there in life and let this be the day of salvation for them. Father, we just pray that you'd move by your spirit, we ask these things in your precious name. Amen.
Amen. If y'all didn't like that, just go home. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Lord, we worship you. Let's stand together in honor of Jesus and worship him. Let's say, Lord. time we've had already. I just want to uh, make mention of this, and that is that tonight we will be receiving an offering that will go towards Brother Bill's ministry, and so we'll be receiving a love offering for him and his ministry tonight. Certainly you can give that this morning if you designate that, but tonight we will have a time of uh, especially giving for that for his ministry as well, okay? So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Brother Billy, would you lead us in prayer? Yes, Lord. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, God.
wants to bow our heads and close our eyes. And I just thank God for his presence this morning. I think God sent me here today for me. It's been a great blessing. You know, sometimes we get in a service like this and the Holy Spirit is moving and speaking and we've sensed the manifested presence and glory of God and we just move right into the next scheduled thing on the program. But I don't want us to miss this moment. And I'm just wondering, right now, as we sit in the presence of God, is there someone that just like to give their life to Jesus right now? I was preaching at Cypress Baptist Church some time back, and uh, I did the early service. We had six or eight people saved. It was a great early service and when we got to the second service it was just like this and and I said folks I don't want us to just pass by this moment and I said I just feel like there's somebody here today that's empty you're frustrated you've tried religion you've gone to church and you just got a big hole in your heart and and uh, you just don't know what to do and a 30-something-year-old man stood up and said, it's me, in front of about 1,500 people. He just said, it's me. And he came forward, and about five or six more men came forward and got saved. And, and I'm just, well, I know it, this is going to be a bold move for you. I understand that. But I believe the power of God is here this morning, and God will help you. And this isn't to hurt you or embarrass you. This is to help you. And I believe there's somebody here today, you may be a guest. This may be the first time you've ever darkened the doors of this church. You may be a longtime member. But I'm wondering, would there be one or more today that would just say, you know what, Bill, I just need to give my life to Jesus. Maybe you've, you've uh, made a decision before, but you've never had peace. You've, there's been no real joy and victory in your life. And, and you just have all these doubts about where you are with the Lord. And you say, I want to get that settled right now this morning. Would you just stand up right where you are? We're going to give you just a moment, just a moment to stand up and say, that's me. I just need to give my life to Jesus, and I want to do it right now. I want to get it settled right now. Anybody, we're just going to give you a moment as we have this opportunity as the Holy Spirit speaking and moving across this place today. Anyone? All right. Thank you, Miss Johnette. Well, it's good to be in the house of God. Can I hear an amen right there? Uh, I want to just say before I get into the message today what a joy it is to be back here at Sweetwater. This church is a, a special place for me and Wendy. Uh, we've been coming here a very long time, and I'm glad that uh, Brother Wilton is allowing me to continue to come. As he's uh, been the pastor for some time now, and uh, I listened to Brother Bob's messages. Y'all just had him for revival. And I just thought I'd stop by and clean up all his mess. Amen. And, uh, and uh, no, Brother Bob is a dear, dear friend. And uh, I told some folks earlier today, he frustrates me when he preaches because I read that passage 500 times and then he brings something out I never have seen. And, and I just say, man, you, you anger me. Come on, amen. But uh, he's a dear, dear friend. We preach a lot of conferences together. And We've had a lot of great fellowship, and I know you had a wonderful, wonderful time with Brother Bob, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, being here with him in Bible conference in those days ahead, Lord willing. Well, take your Bible, if you will, and turn to John 21, and uh, I want to just say to Brother Wilton, I love you, and I thank God for you. I appreciate your friendship, and uh, I know this is kind of a last-minute deal, but I believe that God had all this planned. Do you believe that? Uh, I was supposed to have been in Houston, and I was supposed to have been in Ferris, Texas, and now I'm in Quitman, Louisiana, and I just believe I'm where God wants me to be today. Uh, John chapter 21, and we're going to start reading uh, in verse 15. If you're there, say, I'm there. I'm there. 
So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Do you, uh, do you agape me more than these? I don't know what these are. Maybe they were the disciples. Maybe they were the boats they've been fishing in. I don't know exactly what it was, but he said, do you agape me more than these? Probably the other disciples. And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo, I have a, I have a brotherly love. I have... Uh, I have a brotherly love for you, Lord. And he said to him, feed my sheep. He said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape me? Do you love me with a love that expects nothing in return? You just love me with all of your heart? Lord, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. I have a brotherly love for you. I, I care for you. He said to him, tend my sheep. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Do you even have a phileo? Do you even have a brotherly love uh, for me? And Peter was grieved. He was heavy hearted. He was sorrowed in his spirit because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. I want to ask you a question this morning. Have you ever been at a point in your life you felt like you would never be at that point in your life? Something's happened Something's gone on in your life and you just find yourself in a place you thought you'd never dreamed of being. And, and, and man, uh, things may be falling apart. Things are not working out like they thought uh, you, uh, you thought they would. Things are just not coming together. And, and it's just a tough time. Has anybody ever been there? Can I hear an amen? Well, Simon Peter was. Uh, Simon Peter was one of those guys, you know, that he had a lot of zeal for the Lord, you know, and a lot of people give Simon Peter a hard time, and, and, and you know, most of us in this room, if we study the lives of all the disciples, we would probably identify with Simon Peter more than any of them, because he seemed to be always messing up. Come on, amen. You know, he's the guy, you know, we say, well, you know, he, 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 he sunk, you know, he took his eyes off of Jesus, he sunk down in the water, had to cry out for Jesus to, to save him from drowning. Well, let me just say this, in defense of Simon and Peter, he was the only one that got out of the boat. Come on, amen. You see, Simon and Peter was a guy that said, Lord, I'm never going to leave you, I, I love you, Lord, but yet he denied him. And now when we come to this text this morning, Jesus, as we're going to discover, this is the third time that Jesus has revealed himself to the disciples after the resurrection. But somehow in Simon Peter's mind, he was thinking, you know, things aren't just going to be the same. I, I've denied the Lord. I've messed up. I've blown it. Aren't you glad that God is a patient God this morning? And so he has this confrontation with Simon Peter. And I want to give you three simple points today, and we'll be through. If you're still with me, say, I'm with you. First of all, write this down if you want to in the margin of your Bible on a sheet of paper. I want you to see the question A. We're going to look at, at Simon Peter. Now, you're going to have to help me out as we uh, read through this because we need to uh, calculate a few things this morning. We need to look at a few things about this man named Simon Peter. Now, look at verse 1, if you will, of John 21. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and in this way he showed himself. Now, help me count how many disciples were there that day in verse 2. Simon Peter, that's one. Thomas called the twin, that's two. Nathaniel of Canaan, Galilee, how many is that? And the sons of Zebedee, there were two of them, so how many does that make? Five. And two others, that makes how many? Turn to your neighbor and say, remember seven. Seven disciples, two other disciples were together, and notice what the Bible says in verse 3. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we're going with you also. And they went out and immediately got caught, uh, got into the boat. And that night they caught nothing. Now, I believe this this morning, ladies and gentlemen. I believe that Peter was a saved man. Come on, amen. How many of you know saved men and women can do some mighty sinful things at times? 
I believe he was a saved man. Now, watch this. Simon Peter said, I'm going back fishing. Now, nothing wrong with fishing. I, I like to fish. I like to, uh, you know, catch those big uh, white perch and bass and all those things. Nothing wrong with that. And I know many of you uh, men and, and maybe some of you women today, you, you enjoy going out there and, and going fishing. Nothing sinful about fishing within itself. But what the problem was with Simon Peter is he went back to his old life. He, he said, listen, things hadn't worked out like I thought. See, some of you this morning, you've quit, and you don't even know you've quit. Come on, amen. You, you settle down. You, there, there's no fire. There's no zeal. There's no excitement. There's no real worship about you anymore because, man, life is just taking its toll on you. And, and I don't know what it was. I, I don't know what's going on in your life. But a lot of us, maybe not physically, have we gone back into the world, but mentally we've gone back fishing. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying? Now, there's a problem with that because when Simon Peter said, I'm going back fishing, the other six men said, we're going with you. Listen, this is a powerful statement. You never backslide and go by yourself. You know, here's a staggering statistic. When a child gets saved, Brother Larry, about 4% of the time, mom and dad get saved and the family. When a lady, when a mama a wife gets saved, about 14% of the time, the family comes to Christ. But men, 94% of the time, when you get saved, the whole family gets saved. Is anybody listening to what I'm saying? I was just in a Bible conference not long ago with Brother Bob, and, and uh, there was a, a man that came over from Mississippi. Uh, his son had just become the youth pastor at this church where we were having the conference. His son came out of a lifestyle of drugs and alcohol. His uh, girlfriend, now wife, she had been in that lifestyle. They both had been saved, called to the ministry, and now they're serving in this church. So this dad comes over from Mississippi to be with his son and his daughter-in-law, and he's got some other children that are out in the world because this man lived a life of drugs and alcohol before he got saved, but this man is now born again, loves Jesus, and so he comes over to be with his family. Well, this man also had a daughter in Baton Rouge where we were that was living out in the world on drugs, and so his son said to this man, this daddy, Dad, I'm going to go find my sister, and the dad said, son, we don't even know where she is. We know she's somewhere in Baton Rouge, but we don't know where she is. And the son said, God's going to show me. And the first place he went, Brother Wilton, in Baton Rouge, he pulled up in a neighborhood, and there she was sitting on the curb. She got in the truck, got her boyfriend in the truck. They came Sunday morning to the Bible conference. When I preached that morning, both of them got saved. Isn't that wonderful? Is anybody listening to me? Well, <laughs> oh, oh, Denver... Man, he's all fired up. Man, his, his son's been saved, daughter-in-law saved. They're called to ministry. Now his daughter and her, husband, or her boyfriend are now saved. And so he gets up the next morning, 5.30 in the morning, and he goes down to the gas station to put gas in his truck. And uh, a guy pulled up beside him in a big old lineman truck, and he began to share the gospel with him. And, and, and he said, do you know Jesus? And the guy said, well, I know who he is. He said, well, do you know if you died today, you'd go to spend eternity with the Lord Jesus? He said, I'm not sure about that. He said, can I pray with you? He said, just a minute. He went and got his whole crew, and Denver led the whole bunch of them to Jesus. And Denver told me a story. He said, I'm raising three of my grandchildren, seven, five, and one, and he's about my age. He said, when I went to the custody hearing to get custody of my grandchildren, the state's attorney stood up and said, this man has a past. I don't think we ought to award him these children. I think they ought to go into foster care. And Denver's attorney, attorney stood up and said, I, I believe we ought to at least hear Denver's side of the story. And the judge said, I want to hear it. So he got on the stand, and here's what he said. He said, man, I do have a past, a very rough past, but I've been saved out of drugs and alcohol. He said, I love the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not doing all that nonsense anymore. He said, I'm raising these kids to love Jesus and to live right in their community and to be a product, uh, productive citizen in our, in our city and in our nation, and, and, and that's all I had to offer. And the judge looked at the state's attorney and said, what you going to do with that? <laughs> and he got all three of the grandkids. One, is anybody listening to what I'm saying? One man's influence. But 
Peter said, I'm going fishing. And he took six men with him. You see, Dad, listen to me. Mom, Dad, listen to me. When you backslide on God, when you're not reading the Word in your home, when you're not praying with your kids, when you're not living right, when you're not zealous for the things of God, it affects your kids. Sir, it affects your wife. Mom, it affects the children. It affects your husband. Is anybody getting the picture this morning? Now, why does a saved man go back fishing? Well, I'm glad you asked. Look at Luke chapter 22. Look at Luke 22, just for a second. I want to give you three, three reasons why saved people sin. Three reasons why saved people go back fishing. The first one is found in verse 33 in Luke 22. Jesus had just told Simon Peter, the devil's fixing to sift you as wheat. And he said, Lord, I'm ready to go, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And, and Jesus said in verse 34, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you. Deny me three times that you know me. Here's the first reason saved people go back fishing is because of pride. Let me tell you something. A lot of times, and, 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 and <laughs> And this is so true, and it was, it was so vivid to me again just recently. I was in a tent revival in B.B., Arkansas just a couple of weeks ago. And uh, this, it, it became so real to me again. A lot of times when we have been saved for a long time, we're not as hungry for the Word, and we're not as deep in prayer as we were when we first got saved. And that's Pride. Because we're saying to God, we can handle it. Look at me, sir. You can't handle it. At this tent revival, there was, they had to celebrate the discovery, celebrate recovery in their church. And there was a, a, quite a few of those folks that had been in that program at the church that came to that tent revival. And I'm talking about 50, 60, 70 year old men and women. This one lady came up to me and she said, the best thing ever happened to me in my life is when I went to jail because that's where I met Jesus. She said, I just got out of jail. I've been in there two years. Another lady walked up to me. She said, I got her beat. I've been in 10 years. Then another lady who just got out of prison, she said, I'm 70 and I got saved six months ago and she was excited for the Lord. And I said, man, you got the real deal. She said, honey, I'm too old not to have the real deal. Come on, amen. You see, pride will keep us from going on with God. Pride will get us back fishing. Is anybody listening to what I'm saying? Here's the second thing I want you to see. Look, look at verse 46. Jesus had gone into the garden of Gethsemane, and the, he came back to check on the disciples. In verse 46, he said to them, Why do you sleep, rise, and pray, lest you enter into temptation? Here's the second reason to save people, go back fishing, is prayerlessness. You've heard me say this before, and I'll say it again. Prayer is the most powerful tool we have as a child of God, but why is it the least attended meeting we have in the church? One pastor said, we got to pray about some things. And one lady said, you mean it's come to that? <laughs> a lot of times we use prayer as a last resort. We go to God in prayer when we can't get a grip on it. We go to God in prayer when things are falling apart. We go to God in prayer when things are getting messed up. Listen, that ought to be the first thing we do is take it to God in prayer. I wrote this down in my prayer journal. If it's big enough to worry about, it's big enough to pray about. Can anybody hear me? And if we would take the little things to God when they first happened, they wouldn't come to be big things. My dad used to tell me, he said, son, especially when I was a teenager, he said, when you get in trouble, you come directly to me. Because if you come straight to me, we can probably work it out. But the longer it goes, the harder it's going to be to deal with. Is anybody listening to what I'm saying? There was a missionary over in Africa he, uh, he got cornered by a lion, and there was no way out. He just fell on his knees, and he said, Lord, if you don't deliver me from this lion, he's going to eat me alive. And the lion just took off. When he went back home, he was rejoicing that night, lay down in the bed, turned the light off, and a little mosquito began to buzz around his head. He turned the light on, he'd try to find it, turn it off, a little mosquito buzz around his head. And before long, the sun was coming up, hadn't slept a wink all night. And God said, yeah, you'll, try, you'll, you'll, you'll trust me with the lions, but what about the mosquitoes? Is anybody getting anything out of what I'm saying? Here's the third thing I want you to see. Not only pride and prayerlessness, but look at verse 55. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, this is the crowd that had called call for Jesus to be crucified, Peter sat down among them. Not only will pride and prayerlessness get you back fishing, but also the people you hang around with. 
Now, I know there's a lot of talk going on right now about, you know, church attendance and folks are, you know, not coming back to church after COVID and all that. And I know some folks are still struggling, and I understand that. But I want to tell you, if you can go to Sam's and Walmart and ball games and restaurants, you can come to church. Come on, amen. Now, listen to me. I want you to understand something. Church attendance, gathering together, is essential. We need one another. Iron sharpens iron. We need the fellowship. God didn't call us to live the Christian life alone. Come on, amen or not. He even sent out the disciples two by two. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. One of the devil's key, uh, key weapons against the child of God is to isolate us. Is anybody hearing me? And when we get on social media and we watch the news and we start listening to all this garbage that's being, uh, that's being told and, and we get around people that don't love God and, and are not magnifying the Lord and they're downing the church and talking negative about the people. Listen, I'll tell you, won't be long, buddy. You'll be, out, you'll be out there with them. My dad was one of the greatest mechanics Northwest Louisiana ever had, but I never saw him work on a car in a white tuxedo because I don't care how good of a mechanic you are, you get under a hood long enough, you're going to get grease on you. Is anybody listening to me? Peter was a saved man. He was a sinful man. But watch this. <laughs> if you're still with me, say amen. amen. Look, at, look at verse... Uh, Look at verse 3 again. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we're going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. I don't know if you've ever been on the Sea of Galilee or not, but it's impossible to go on the Sea of Galilee and not catch fish. Matter of fact, they'll jump in the boat with you. Now, these are professional fishermen. They'd been, they'd been fishing all night. They hadn't caught a fish. And so J Jesus, look at verse 5. This is amazing. Jesus said to them in verse 5, children, do you have any food? And they answered him, no. Now, I, I don't believe for one minute they just said, no, we hadn't caught anything. I believe they were, they were totally frustrated. I believe it was more like this, no! You know, Brother Wilton, I, I've been a pastor, and I'm glad I pastored a while, because I can have the heart, you know, for a pastor, know some of the things he's going through. And I often wonder, why are there so many mean people in church? Why are there so many negative people in church? Let me tell you one reason. If you're saved, you can't live in the world and be happy. You can try, but if you've got the Holy Ghost of God in you, you can't be at peace. And then you come to church, and you get around a bunch of spirit-filled people, and that frustrates you. Because you know that's where you ought to be. Come on, amen. So you can't live in the world. You can't be at peace in church because you're backslidden. You've gone back fishing in your heart and mind, if not physically. And I want you to understand something. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter was a, he was a sinful man, but he was a sorrowful man. He was dealing with sorrow because he was away from God. Let me tell you something. Every time you read about sin in the Bible, it always follows with this. There's death. The soul that sinneth, it shall surely die. The wages of sin is death. And I want you to know something, ladies and gentlemen, even for a child of God, when we wander away from the Lord, I'm telling you, it'll cause you to die. It'll frustrate. Come on, somebody help me this morning. Now notice what the Bible says in verse 6. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. Uh, you gotta get. You gotta really pay attention to this. Just don't. Just don't read through this. There's a whole lot of golden nuggets right in here. And you. Have, and, and so they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fishes. One word from Jesus, they had a whole net full of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, "That's John. It's the Lord." Now, when Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it and plunged into the sea. Let me ask you something. If the Lord Jesus Christ came back right now, would you be embarrassed for him to see you how you are? What about your prayer life? What about your giving? What about your holy life, holy, ho holiness of walk? What, what about your soul winning? You know, there's an interesting uh, scripture. Jesus said, when I come back, you know what he's going to be looking for? He's going to be looking for faith. 
Are you walking in faith? Are you walking in victory? I mean, if Jesus came back this very moment and you stood before him right where you are spiritually, could you say, Lord, I've given it all. I've, I've, given, I, I've given every. No, most of us couldn't. So Peter was embarrassed, so he put on another garment. And he plunged himself into the sea in verse 7. Look at verse 8. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land. About 200 cubits, that's about 100 yards, dragging the net with fish. And then as soon as they came to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. You see, the first thing I want you to see is the questionee. Peter was a saved man. He was a sinful man. He was a sorrowful man. But now we come to the questioner. We come to the man who's asked the questions, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when Peter got on the shore, now watch this. There he was with Jesus, and Jesus already had a fire built. And notice what it said. It was a fire of coals. Now, we just read over in Luke twenty two fifty five 55, where they had a fire that, Jesus, that Peter, he, kindled, he warmed himself after they kindled that fire. It's the same word here. It's a charcoal fire. And hey, look at me. Everybody in here knows what a charcoal fire smells like. You walk out of your house, and you say, somebody's cooking out. Come on, Amen. I can gain five pounds smelling a charcoal fire. Is anybody with me? <laughs> and Jesus said in verse 10, bring some of the fish which you've now just caught. And Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 150 and three. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. And Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you, knowing it was the Lord? Now, the Bible tells us in verse 4, they didn't even recognize it was Jesus. Here's, here's the question pre preachers get asked a lot. How can I know the voice of God? I don't know if it's God talking to me and not the devil or not myself, not my flesh. Listen, the Bible, Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. And they follow me. And a stranger they will not follow. Come on, amen. But I'm going to tell you, when you go back fishing, you can't even, dis come on, somebody say amen right here. You can't even discern it. They had seen Jesus raise the dead, cause blind eyes to see. They had seen him feed the 5,000, feed the 4,000. They had seen him do miracle after miracle, and now they don't even recognize Jesus. So there used to be a time in your life that you were walking with God. Man, you heard his voice. I mean, you wept over your sin. You wept over souls. You were so overcome. Man, listen, I'm telling you, Brother Larry, I, I thought it was at Brooklyn Tabernacle this morning. Come on, amen. I mean, it was good. I mean, you wept during worship and your heart was so full. And now you can sit in a service like this and not, you don't even know it's Jesus. A pastor just said the other day, Brother Wilton, he used to sit on the platform. He said, I quit sitting on the platform because my heart got so grieved because so few people were engaged in worship. We come to services like this. Listen, I'm telling you, you got one of the greatest preaching pastors in the country. Come on, somebody amen right here. You've got, listen, this choir, the, the atmosphere of this church, this is one of my favorite places to come. And I'm not just saying that so, you know, I can come back before Brother Bob. Come on, amen, listen to me. I'm just saying, ladies and gentlemen, God's in this house, and some of us don't even recognize it. But now they knew it was Jesus. Why? If I wasn't so fat, I'd turn a flip right now. Amen. Listen. <laughs> Why? Because everything they'd been looking for all night long, Jesus already had on the shore. Can I tell all the young people here today? You're not going to find anything out there that's going to satisfy you. Everything you're looking for is in Jesus Christ. Sir, it's not in another relationship. It's not in another uh, million dollars. It's, it's in Jesus Christ. Come on, amen. Ladies, it's not in some new fad. It's in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me ask you a question. Ron Dunn used to say the reason we don't get a whole lot out of our Bible reading is because we don't, have, we don't use our sanctified imagination. When I was reading this, I wondered, where did Jesus get those fish and where did he get that bread? There wasn't a 7-Eleven. Come on, amen. There wasn't a Super One. I, I believe now, if you preach the sermon, you can preach it like you want to. I'm preaching it right now, okay? 
You remember when Jesus had been fasting and praying for 40 days and 40 nights, and the devil said, you've got to be hungry. He said, look at that rock right there. It looks like a loaf of bread. Why don't you pick that up and turn it into bread and eat it? And Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. But I believe on this day, he looked down, he saw a stone that looked like a loaf of bread. He picked it up and said, bread, and said, devil, I can do it anytime I want to. I'm God. Where did he get that fish? I believe he just said fish, and a big old perch just jumped out of the sea of Galilee right in the grease. You say, you really believe that? If he can speak the world into existence, he can get a perch in a pan. But well, everything we need is in Jesus Christ. Now here's something powerful. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't miss this. Please don't miss this. Look at verse 11 again. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 150 and 3. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Now, wait a minute. Go back up to verse 6. So they cast, and now they were not able to, they, seven, seven men, seven disciples. So they cast, and now they, were they, seven disciples, were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Now, look down here. Simon Peter went up and dragged, wait a minute. One man did what seven couldn't do. I, I'm going to show you something God's been dealing with me about. You going to still love me? You going to love me when I get through saying this? We had, hey, have you heard of so-and-so church? Oh, yeah, that's a good church. Have you met brother so-and-so? Yeah, he's a good preacher. Have you met the folks down there at that church? Yeah, they're good folks. Therein lies the problem. The world is not going to be changed by good churches and good preachers and good people. The world's going to be changed by spirit-filled churches and spirit-filled preachers and spirit-filled people. There's a difference. You see, here's what I believe. I believe one person here this morning gets saved, get full of the Holy Ghost. You can do what seven people in this church that aren't saved and not full of the Holy Ghost could do. Is anybody getting anything out of what I'm saying? The question E is Peter. The questioner is Jesus. Let me, let me tell you about Jesus. Jesus is a patient Lord. Aren't you glad of that? There they were out fishing, but he was standing on the seashore waiting on them. I don't know about you, but I'm glad God's been patient with me. I said, I don't know about you, but I'm glad God's been patient with me. I, I'm, I'm glad God didn't give up on me. Come on, amen. Now watch this. Some of you have given up on yourself, but Jesus hadn't given up on you. He's a patient Lord. Second of all, he's a perceptive Lord. He knows exactly what we need when we need it. And third of all, he's a powerful Lord. He can provide it. Come on, amen. He can provide whatever you need. Listen, uh, Brother Wilton said, you know, y'all just got back from Kenya. And I said, yeah, matter of fact, Wendy and I are leaving uh, a week from tomorrow to go back to Kenya. And when we got to Kenya, there were all kind of obstacles. They said, we couldn't do this, we couldn't do that. And I want to tell you, I don't have time right now because I know we're about out of Baptist Standard Time. But I, I want to tell you something. God provided one miracle after another miracle so we could do what he called us to do. Come on, amen. And I want to tell you, if we'll, if we'll put our fishing poles back up and say, Lord, we believe that you're a powerful Lord, you're a perceptive Lord, you're a patient Lord, here we are, we messed up, God, we haven't been walking in faith, we've been going through the motions, we've been in the mully grubs, we've been down and out, but Lord Jesus, we repent. Now here's the question. If you're still with me, say amen. amen. Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? I believe after the third time, Peter was grieved because he remembered the three times that he had denied the Lord. And when he got around that charcoal fire and he smelled that charcoal fire, his mind went back over to Luke 22 when he had denied the Lord and even cursed the Lord and said, I don't even know who you're talking about. And his heart was broken. You see, two times Jesus said, do you agape me? Do you love me with a God kind of love? Just to serve, sell out to me no matter what happens. No matter if you ever get a blessing in return. And Peter replied to him, well, Lord, you know I like you. That was a safe answer. 
You see, here's what it means to love Jesus and not like, most everybody in here, we like Jesus. But let me tell you what it means to love Jesus. It means to lay your life down to the point of physical death for the glory of God. The bottom line why God saved us, ladies and gentlemen, is not for us just to get out of hell and thank God that's part of it. Amen. Matter of fact, the reason I got saved, when I got saved that night, I knew I was headed to hell. But I want to tell you something, I've, I've grown enough in the Lord, and I'm mature enough in the Lord to know, ladies and gentlemen, God didn't just save me to get out of hell, but to bring glory to Him no matter what it costs me. Because you see, Jesus paid the ultimate price on the cross. He died on the cross. He shed his blood on the cross. He was nailed to the cross for me and you. He had to sacrifice himself. He had to die and be buried and raised again from the dead. That's the gospel. That's the good news. So we might be redeemed. We might be set free. We might be forgiven. And here's what Jesus said. If you're going to follow me, there's a cross. That's not the cross that he bore because he could only bear that cross. But our cross is to die to our dreams, our ambitions, our wills, our goals, and say, Jesus, I don't know what it's going to take for you to bring glory, uh, get glory through my life. But whatever it is, come on, somebody help me right here. You see, our idea of revival in America is to have a full church, a full bank account, everybody be happy. Hey, that message doesn't fly overseas. We, we now have six nations represented in our Bible college, the Compel Outreach Bible University in India. One of those nations is, is Bhutan. Bhutan is, is, is a closed nation. It, you, can, you can get arrested and even killed for sharing the gospel in Bhutan. But I want to tell you something. Here's the amazing thing. We've got graduates that have gone back from our, our Bible college. They're now back in Bhutan. They're sharing the gospel. They're planting churches. And here's the miracle that just happened. The pastors in that area, in, in that country, they said, listen, we're so, we're so blessed by what God's done in these students. We're, they, they said, Bill, we're sending you 30 more. We're sending you 30 more students to train them and bring them back. And listen, now what they're saying is we want to get trained in the, in the gospel. We want to be trained for the ministry and we want to come back. And even if it costs us our life, so be it for the glory of God. And we can't get Baptists to get in a nice automobile and drive to a beautiful building in an air-conditioned and heated automobile and sit on a padded pew for a couple hours. God help us. But let me tell you what Jesus was doing right here. This is the good news. Every time Peter answered him, notice what Jesus said. Verse 15, feed my lambs. Verse 16, feed my, tend my sheep. Verse 17, feed my sheep. You know what he was doing? He was restoring Peter. Three times he denied him, and now three times he's asking him, do you love me? And Peter's getting restored. And now, just flip over a couple of pages, and he's standing up on the day of Pentecost after being filled with the Holy Ghost, and 3,000 people get saved. But Brother Wilton, I believe this. I, I believe every child of God, I, I don't care how young or old, I believe every time a person gets saved, their heart's desire is to be used of God. I don't believe you're saved if you don't care if God used you or not. I'm, I'm going to make a powerful statement right here. I'd rather for the Lord to take me to heaven this afternoon than to put me on a, on a shelf somewhere and never use me again. Do you love Jesus this morning? I guess that's the question in it. Do we really love Jesus? Or do we just have an affection for him? Can we just have some real talk this morning? This section, can we just talk? Just us. Can we talk? How about this section? Four of you. Anybody else? <laughs> can this section, can we talk? Amen. Sound booth, can we talk? Can we talk over here? Yeah. I've wanted to give up before. Anybody else? Brother Wilton, I've gone to the shed and got my fishing pole back out. <laughs> They're not going to treat me like that. I was walking down the hall the other day and old Dick and so-and-so didn't even speak to me. I ain't going back. Well, instead of getting all bent out of shape, you know what y'all do? Go home and call Dick and so-and-so and say, you know, you walked by me in the hall today and you were so uh, concentrating on something, you were so preoccupied, something's on your heart. Can I pray with you about that?
I got disappointed in church. I'm going back fishing. I was witnessing to a guy in Wiley, Texas, and he said, I quit going to church because I had a bad experience about 20 years ago in church. I said, you did? He said, yeah, I had a real bad experience in church. I said, about 20 years ago. He said, yeah. I said, I did too. About 20 years ago. And I was the pastor. Hey, preachers got feelings too. But every time I've gone to get that fishing pole out, I thought about my mom and dad. And the times they set me down at a kitchen table and read the Bible to me and prayed and took me to church and taught me to love God. Every time I've gone to get that fishing pole, I've thought about my wife who's been with me 41 years now. Never, never complained about places we've lived and things we've done and all the miles that we've traveled around the world. Never complained. And when I was on the road 20 years, when she was home raising the kids, never complained about me being gone all those years. Faithfully serving God. And then, and then I think about, about my, my kids. I get that fishing, and I think, man, what are, what are my kids going to think when their daddy goes back on God? I think about Brother Wilton and all the pastors and preachers that have poured into my life all these years and have mentored me and prayed over me. Some of them are in heaven tonight or today, but, but many of them are still alive, and, 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 and they, they pray for me, and they, they call me, and they check, what, what, what am I going to do? You know, I, I preached, I don't know how many hundreds of youth revivals and, 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 and youth camps and disciple nows, and I've seen hundreds, maybe thousands of young people get saved and called to ministry. What are they going to say when Big Papa goes back on God? Do you know what I think about the most? Is my Lord and Savior. Who looked down at a teenage boy one, one Tuesday night and said, I'm going to save him. And he could save me because over 2,000 years ago, he had six-inch spikes in his hands and a nine-inch spike through his feet. And he had a spear in his side and a crown of thorns on his head. And they plucked the beard out of his face and they spit upon him and hit him with a fist and open hand and mocked him and ridiculed him. And he, he shed every drop of his blood, and he died and went to that old cold barred tomb. And on the third day, he rose again from the dead for me so that I could, Why am I going to go back on somebody that loves me like that? But we do. We go back fishing. But it's time to put the fishing poles up this morning. Because Jesus is waiting on the seashore. Not to condemn you, but to restore you. And he's got fish and bread waiting on you. Everything you've been looking for out there in the world, a relationship you thought would bring joy, a, a, another, another paycheck, a, a bigger house, a, a new car, and all those things have left you empty. Jesus is waiting on the seashore. And he's just saying, hey, cast your nets on the right side of the ship. You see, ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, we, we toil and struggle, and we and it's like the old hymn says, uh, oh, what needless pain we bear because we won't take our prayers to the Lord. Come on, amen. It's time to come home. Yeah. It's time to quit being a pew sitter. Hello? Hey, can I tell you something this morning? And I may say this again tonight. Did you know there's 3.2 billion people in the world that have never heard the name of Jesus? You know, there's about 5 billion people. There's about 5 billion people in the world that are still lost and on their way to hell. And you think one pastor and a staff's going to win all those people to Jesus? You think a handful of folks that come to church and serve God out of a multitude of people? Listen, no, listen back row, front row, size, middle, let me tell you something. It's time for all of us to put our fishing pole back up and say, Jesus, you, you're worthy. You deserve my best. I'm all in. No matter what it costs me. 
I put on Twitter the other day, I said, if you know where your deer stand is, but you don't know where your Sunday school class is, you need revival. If you know what time the ball game kicks off, but you don't know what time worship is, you need revival. If you can find your shotgun, but you can't find your Bible, you need revival. Is anybody getting the picture? Let's pray. I don't want to get ready to go home. I want to get ready to do business with the Lord. Hey, would you get real this morning? Would you get honest? Listen, I know this Sunday wasn't planned by us, but I believe it's planned by God. Yeah. I believe Brother Wilton said it right. I believe God. this is a God thing. God knew who was going to be here. He knew I was going to be here. He knew what I was going to share this morning. And I'm just going to be flat honest. I needed this service as bad as anybody in this room. And I want to ask you a, co a couple of questions. How many of you in this place and maybe even watching live stream how many of you in this room say hey Bill no, our, our heads are about right. we're not here to trick you and embarrass you but I just want to ask you a few questions how many of you just say hey Bill if I died today if Jesus Christ came back today man I don't hope I'm saved I don't think I'm saved that's been settled a long time ago or maybe it was saved, settled last week you say, hey, I know I'm saved. I know I'm going to spend eternity with the Lord Jesus in heaven. Not because of what I've done, but because of what he did on the cross and when he rose again from the dead. And I know by grace I'm saved through faith, not by what I've done. I'm not saved by getting baptized. I'm not saved by joining the church, walking an aisle. I've given my life to Jesus. He's Lord of my life. And he changed my life. And I know I'm saved. Can I just see your hand up all over this room today? God bless you. Put your hands down. Can we get real this morning, church? I'm going to ask everybody to just raise your hand this question. How many of you in this room would say, hey, Bill, listen, I'm saved, but I've gone back fishing. I haven't gone back to the bar room. I haven't gone, you know, out in the world doing all this stuff, but just in my heart, I've gone back fishing. I'm not as fire, fired up for the Lord as he used to be. I'm not as zealous for the things of God as he used to be. I've let the work, cares of the world it's like Jesus said, I've let the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches rob me for where I ought to be with the Lord. And I depend on other people here at Sweetwater to get the job done, but I need to put my fishing pole back up, and I need to get busy serving God. I need to get serious. I need to repent. Maybe some sin. Maybe you are in the far country. Maybe you are backslidden away from God in, 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 outside of church. And you need to get right with God. Sir, maybe you've gone back fishing in your home. You're not leading your family in the things of God. You're not talking to your wife and kids about Jesus. You know, we get all been out of shape when they took prayer and Bible reading out of the school. We took prayer and Bible reading out of the living room a long time before that. And I wonder how many of you say, Preacher, I know I'm saved, but I'm not where I need to be. And I need to put my fishing pole back up. I need to get serious about my walk with God. Can I just see your hand up all over this house today? All over this house. Hey, will you just get up out of your seat and let's just get around the altar and pray? Can we do that? Just come put your fishing pole up here at the altar. Come on. There ought to be dozens of you coming. Come on. Don't just sit there like you've done so many times when the Holy Spirit's dealt with you. You say, well, I just came to the altar last week. Come again. It doesn't feel good when the Lord's rebuking us and correcting us, but I'm going to tell you something. It'll be sweet when it's done. I just felt impressed to ask this question right here. Hey, listen, by the way, if you can't kneel down or stand up, just sit on one of these front rows, make that your altar, you can come. But I, I want to just, I want to, I just feel impressed to ask this question before we move on. Is there somebody here today you just say, Bill, I'm so far from God, I don't even know how to get back. I'm just way out there. And I don't even know if the Lord would ever take me back. Let me tell you something, he's waiting for you right now. I don't care how far you've gone, how long it's been, he's waiting for you right now. He's got fish and bread on the seashore waiting on you. You say, Bill, listen, that's me. I, I, man, there used to be a time in my life I was in the Word, I prayed, I, I loved God, I shared my faith with my buddies at work, at school, or whatever. But man, I'm just, man, I'm just out there somewhere. Pray for me. Would you just raise your hand up real high and say, that's me today. That's me today. And if that's you, just come on. 
You might want to just take Brother Wilton by the hand and say, Brother Wilton, pray for me. I just need to come home. I need to come home. But I want to ask you this question before we pray and sing. How many of you in this room today would say, Bill, if I died today, if Jesus Christ came back today, I hope I'm saved, buddy. I think I am, but i got to be honest, man. I'm not sure. I don't want to go to hell, but I'm not real sure I'm going to be with the Lord Jesus in a place called heaven either. And I want you to pray for me. Would you just raise your hand up real high and say, that's me today? If I die today, Bill, I hope I go to heaven. I think I will, but I'm just not real sure about that. Just raise your hand up real high today and say, that's me. Pray for me. Pray for me. Anybody? I want to pray for you here in just a moment. Just slip your hand up real high. This is not trick you, to embarrass you, to hurt you. This is to help you. Now listen, if that's you, whether you raise your hand or not, can you pray with me right now and ask the Lord to save you? Maybe you're a first-time guest. Maybe you're a long-time member. But God's Spirit's dealing with you right now. Would you come, give your life to Christ today, and just start by doing this right where you are. Just ask the Lord to save you. The Bible says, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How do we call on the name of the Lord? We pray. You say, well, I don't know what to say. I'll help you, okay? You can pray something like this. You, you can say it out loud. You can say it in the privacy of your heart. You can put this prayer in your own words. We just pray something like this. We're just going to confess what the Bible says. You ready? If you don't have that assurance, don't, listen, please don't leave this service without Jesus today. He's waiting on you with open arms. Just pray something like this. Just say, dear Lord Jesus. I'm a sinner, but I believe you love me, Jesus, and I believe you died for me on the cross, and I believe you rose again from the dead. Tell him, and then say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin. I repent. Forgive me. Cleanse me. I give you my life right now. Tell him that. I give you my life right now. And then say, Lord Jesus, I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. And then tell him this, Lord, I'll serve you the rest of my life because you died for me. And then by faith, just thank you for saving you this morning. With their heads bowed, eyes closed. How many of you just prayed that simple prayer of faith with me? Can I just see your hand? Just slip your hand up real high where I can see you. Just slip your hand up real high where I can see you. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? Now listen, I'm going to ask you to do something that's going to take a lot of courage, all right? If you prayed with me, I want you to look up here at me, just those that prayed with me. Did you ask the Lord to save you this morning? You mean business, don't you? Amen. Praise God. Can you just keep looking right here for just a minute? Anybody else? Just keep looking right here. I want to talk to you for just a second. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 32 and 33, if you will confess him before people here on earth, he'll confess you before the Father one day in heaven. But if we deny him here on earth, he'll deny us before the Father. And what does that mean? Jesus has no secret disciples. He calls us publicly. One of the reasons I knew I got saved when I was a teenager is I, I wasn't ashamed of it. I wanted somebody to know about it. And everybody that's followed Jesus, everybody, all, all did it publicly. So I'm going to ask you to do what Jesus commands us to do, and that's to openly to confess him. So here's how we're going to do it. If you prayed with me, you, you said, Bill, I'm giving my life to Jesus this morning. I want you to stand up right now where you are. Don't wait on anybody else. Don't look around to see if anybody else is going to stand up. Just stand up. It's just between you and the Lord. Would you just come right down here and share that with the pastor? Somebody else? Somebody else? Let's all stand together quickly and quietly. I'm going to pray in just a moment. Brother Larry's going to lead us in this song of invitation. But before we pray and sing, can we do this? Can you just turn to your neighbor very quietly and look at them? Maybe somebody you know you don't know might be your family, might be a guest, I don't know. Just look at them and say, hey, if your life were over today, do you know for sure you'd be with Jesus in a place called heaven? And it's, listen, if you don't know that, don't be ashamed just to, to say, no, I don't know it. Because you're among people that love you. Come on, amen. And they've been praying for you. And if the person next to you says, man, I'm just not sure. Don't lie, God. You can't lie to God. You say, I'm not sure. And if that person says, I'm not sure, just take them by the hand and say, come on, I'll go with you. Friends, don't let friends drive drunk. Friends, don't let friends go to hell. Come on, amen. So turn to somebody right now all over this building. Don't just stand there and look at me or look at the floor. Turn to somebody and ask them. And if that person doesn't know, just grab them by the hand and say, come on. Come on, I'll go with you right now. I'll go with you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, continue to move by your spirit. Save the lost, revive your church is our prayer in Christ's name. As we sing, you come.